Great, so welcome back. Um, this is our last panel of the day, so we're due to finish at 4.30, 45 minutes. Um, so shaping the future of real estate, we um, this is a broad and all-encompassing subject, So, but we thought it very important to, to discuss the impact of technology and what, what is it, um, <clears throat> how it's going to impact the, the, the real estate sector going forward. So we've, we've put together an exciting panel with us today. So we've got uh, Roger Clark, CEO of IPX, IPSX, um, the real estate stock exchange. Um, James Beaumont, CFO of Industrial Street, and Darren Dean Heiss. Is that is that? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Head of Corporate Finance and Investor Relations at Grip Real Estate in yeah. Down here. So like I said, technology is going to play in a, a huge role in, in all aspects of our lives, but also in property um, in various guises. Um, I think we'll come to, to James first. Um, what, what are your experiences of implementing technology into um, industrial um, business? So we, we started to transition of our business um, about four years ago from being a traditional uh, real estate uh, owner across a number of uh, different um, regions and uh, sub asset classes, commercial, uh, hotels, um, retail. And that transition has seen us not only become fully multi-let industrial um, uh, logistics uh, sector, but it's also seen us deliver uh, an operating business or an operating platform to allow us to, to operate that. So in the past, when you're, you're working with a, uh, a large commercial building such as this one, you might have one or two uh, leases that you need to um, re-gear or, or renew every five to ten years but in the MLI space there's a lot of activity it's asset management intensive there's a there's lots of uh, expected churn of leases such that the um, the lease average length is around four years or so and in order to do that effectively and efficiently um, there was the opportunity to to acknowledge the fact that we needed to use technology and we we needed to become uh, a true operating business as opposed to just a traditional landlord. So that led us to look at um, what does that platform look like? And we, we looked at a few uh, options and we, we ended up with um, Microsoft as a, as a platform. It's cloud-based, uh, Microsoft D365. Um, it is uh, able to be configured relatively easily along with various other um, modules or in which independent solution vendors um, can uh, can provide things such as property management. Uh, we've got um, integrations with banks uh, and various other uh, integrations. But what it allowed us to do was to set ourselves up for scale. We always wanted to scale the business. And to do that, you need to be efficient. And to do that, you need to have a technology solution. So there's I, I could talk for hours, I'll let other people talk, but that's why we went into that space. Uh, that, that space and looking at an operating platform and we've we've had it it's been live for around a year it's taken two years or so to get there we've all got various scars in terms of implementing it um, but it is giving us that base from which now to scale what, what are the kind of cost implications for the business um, the, the costs we spent approximately five million uh, on this and so you know that is one of the barriers to entry i'm sure for a number of uh, operators um but it's also the cost of implementing over a one and a half two year period so what we what we built was a, a fully vertically integrated system so we do everything now we've in-house everything accounting property management facilities management um which we hadn't done previously um so there's there's the the costs in terms of cash, but there's also the cost in terms of the investment that the business has to put in to deliver um, the solution. Uh, and as I say, we, we the we, we've been live for a year now, and we're starting to see the benefits of that. Cool, and um, and that's great because, like you said, you're it's a, it's a platform business, so it sort of um, lends itself to that. What what other sort of um, technology? And what other areas of the sector do you think is um, prime for dis disruption? So just maybe adding a bit more on the, on the tech side, you know, that was our um, platform, but there's also the more traditional use of technology in the form of our, you know, the website and how we utilize that to, um, to sort of drive demand, uh, get better engagement with customers. Um, and that may 
include things like um, having a visibility of units through you know, high quality media, um, but also having our smart lease on that website. So when pr prospective customers look at what we have to offer, they don't look and then five days later have a discussion with us and then see what the lease will look like. That lease in its simplest form is, is already on the website, so they can download that. They know it's uh, what it entails. There's no surprises. And we've also taken uh, the approach of having a simple lease, which is less technology, but it's probably worth just um, talking about very briefly. It's a, a four-page lease, which you can readily understand. What that means as well is that when it comes to signing that lease, you, know, we, you can use technology to do that. So in the old days, we used to have uh, Quill and Ink, and now it's DocuSign. Mm. So we can actually go from agreeing terms to uh, signing uh, the, the contract, I say contract, the four-page lease within or under two weeks. Yeah, It's a very quick process, which, again, has really good consequences in terms of reducing void, reducing yeah. uh, non-recoverables in terms of landlord void costs. But it's, again, it just lends to that efficiency component. That's that's why we do this. Yeah, yeah. Gone over the days of months and months of between lawyers kicking it, kicking Absolutely. it around. Yeah. Um, and, and Darren, have, have you seen this? Um, if anyone doesn't know about grip real estate, maybe a um, quick intro okay, yeah. of what, what you do, but what, what are you seeing on, on the tech side? Absolutely. Um, so grip real estate is a pan-African uh, uh, real estate platform. We uh, we obviously investing in, in sort of uh, A grade and P grade buildings um, to multinational tenants. So you know we're trying to replicate a, a Western style product, a European style product on the continent of Africa. So fortunately in Africa we get to sit and watch the best technological uh, um, solutions, uh, and we get to wait and, and then implement the better ones. And so we've certainly seen that we we we're around a, a multi sectoral um, strategy. So we have retail models, hotels. Uh, right into office and some industrial parks. Um, so, you know, I think firstly, through the COVID crisis, uh, we needed good, strong technology because although we have people on the ground across our 10 countries, we needed some fairly good coordination. So, you know, I think we also had, had an in-house uh, system developed where any of our asset managers or facilities managers can on the click of their phone, you know, have a look at what the, port what the portfolio is doing at any point in time. Any requests that are coming through on the properties are, are fed through you know, through mobile apps. Um, but equally, you know, we've managed to then have a look at some of the prop tech solutions that are, are have been successful, certainly in Europe, in our retail malls, uh, looking at foot counts, you know, understanding footfall traffic, understanding how that leasing activity is working, and where that sort of entertainment um, offering has had to be provided. So certainly that's where we've seen it. Um, yeah, we own other properties like the US Embassy corporate accommodation, and you can imagine the technological sort of solutions we've had to provide for those. So, I mean, I could talk for ages, but uh, maybe I'll keep it there. Tonight. <laughs> so, talk, um, talking about disruption, um, Roger, the IPSX is looking to disrupt that listed market in, in real estate in some ways. Um, do you just want to um, briefly in introduce what you guys are looking to do, how it's going, uh, and where you see that one? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. So IPSX is, it stands for the International Property Securities Exchange, which, as you can see, we call ourselves the Real Estate Stock Exchange. In some ways, when we're talking about technology, um, you know, we're a bit of a fraud to be sitting here because the market infrastructure that we are using to create a stock exchange for real estate has been around for 300 years. But we are bringing that to, to a new asset class, to real, to real assets. It's very distinct from the REIT market. You know, I would, um, I'm sure we may or may not agree on this, but, but I would say that both of these companies sit in the stock market. They're part of the equity market. What we're trying to do is fractionalize buildings, fractionalize assets. So very much in the 40 side of the 60-40 split. Um, the technology is tried and tested. Um, our our um, technology stack is largely provided by NASDAQ at the moment. Uh, it's a matching engine. So companies that own a building or small portfolio of buildings will list on our exchange and the trading then takes place on a NASDAQ uh, um, driven matching engine. But where are we going to take it? Where's, what does the future look like? Once we now have this, as we get established, real assets clearly lend themselves to blockchain far more than um, uh, most uh, equities. 
do. So it's inevitable we're talking with lots of digital exchanges uh, who want to partner with us to actually begin to uh, bring tokenized buildings. And in the long run, where I see that going is uh, I see a world in which buildings that are, are listed on our exchange, where you can buy a share for as little as a pound, uh, these buildings will have QR codes outside and as you walk by you'll be able to just scan the code with your phone and if you want to buy a few shares you'll be able to so that's that's where we're heading towards <laughs> that's made and, and how big is it at the moment so at the moment we've uh, we're about to do our fourth issue so we're about to um have that, that will see us have 600 million pounds worth of assets uh listed on the exchange um and uh now that we have done that it's taken um it's taken us to this point to build the exchange to build the infrastructure to get the first few issues trading so that people can see what it looks like we expect that activity to to ramp up quite significantly now. and investors are both um, professional and and retail correct correct with a with a caveat of course as always we, yeah we run two markets one is called ipsx prime that is open to retail investors, all investors, including retail investors. Uh, we have run another market called IPSX Wholesale. That is only open to professional investors. Uh, so far, those first four have gone on to our wholesale market, but we are in the latter stages of, of bringing um, uh, the first prime market uh, company to, uh, to the exchange. And that will be really exciting because at that point, platforms like Primary Bid Hargreaves as our interactive investor in AJ Bell, they will make these shares available. Uh, as you were saying, maybe you will then be able to um, just buy shares through the app on your phone. Um, it's um, it, it's it's months away. Exciting. Um, so just moving back a bit, um, back to you, James, um, on on the technology that you guys have implemented, how that's worked. <laughs> what in in sort of monetary terms? What kind of value creation is that brought to the business? That's an interesting one because there, there is no specific sum, but what it, what it has done, um, it's helped us with a number of things, customer penetration, also the uh, reduction of the voids and the, the non-recoverables of a said. And when you're in a, uh, a business like ours, those marginal gains, those marginal savings really do help um, drive earnings. And it, it allows us then to be ready when we do take on more assets to be able to do so in, in a much more efficient way. So putting a, a number to it is very difficult. Um, but at the same time, what it has allowed us to do is to be ready um, for, for that scale that I talk about. So when you put on an extra um, 100 million of assets, for example, the cost of that, the incremental cost of that will be will be much less. Uh, and indeed, those marginal savings, one, two percent in terms of the, the leakage um, will will not crystallize if, if you can uh, transact quickly. Um, so that's a difficult question, actually, but uh, yeah, there are certainly gains there. That's fine. So um, we've touched on throughout the panels throughout the day, um, ESG, energy efficiency, um, EPC ratings, things like that. How, how can technology really help you guys um, in that, in sort of data collection, maybe, and, and things like that? Is, Darren, what, what are you guys looking at on that side of things? Uh, yeah, I think that's 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 a really interesting one because certainly the way we're funding ourselves at the moment is through um, IFC loans and the, the part of the, the, the World Bank the development institution. And their green agendas and ESG agendas are obviously pretty robust. Um, so what we're having to do is collect a lot of data on electricity usage, carbon emissions, and although the carbon neutral legislation does not apply to us in Africa, we've adopted that as a, as a self-adopted uh, policy. So, you know, for us, it's about understanding our baselines, understanding how to measure and then improve on those. But fortunately, a, a number of the, uh, the, um, the DFIs are helping and supporting in the adoption of the technology to help us measure that. I think just going back to, uh, back to Richard's point about sort of technology at the moment for us, unfortunately, is still a cost, as we can see it's in our admin cost lines. But the beauty of this is the scalability is unbelievable. You know, we can double our asset base and probably only have to inc increase our overheads circa 5%. So you know, the scalability, the investments up front is great because the scalability it provides you in the future. Uh, obviously, we're in nine countries. So you know, to replicate a cost base in nine countries is very expensive. So technology has to become part of your solution. And that goes from measuring your ESG credentials, your carbon emissions, uh, green initiatives, right through to social initiatives. Um, 
Um, and actually, I'm going to chat to Roger afterwards because we see these as wonderful opportunities to involve your communities, um, whether that's you know, in interesting areas or, or fractional ownerships of, of, um, of assets. So I think that'll be a theme. Sorry, I went off topic there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you mentioned earlier about obviously being in, in Africa, you, you see all these technologies sort of develop in the Western worlds, and then you can sort of come along and pick, pick the best when they have developed. Um, is, are, are there any examples of that that, that you, you've implemented in your um, portfolio? The simplest ones are the shopping malls. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much was out there in terms of people trying to tell you that they can help you optimize the assets because we all know that the retail assets have all been fairly distressed, um, both in Africa as well as Europe. So that, I think we were lucky. We were able to come in with the, the solutions that were tried and tested. Um, and we were sort of towards the end of the, of the cost curve. So we weren't paying top dollar for them. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the easiest example to give you. Um, although, yeah, there's, there's a number of different examples. Yeah. Um, and maybe another one is solar panels. Um, I don't know, obviously you, in Africa, the sun shines a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and James, you, you guys got a lot of flat roofs. The, uh, the, the, the sun shines know? less in the northwest <laughs> and, and Scotland. But again, at the moment, we, it's, it's a largely untapped potential that we have. You know, we, we have um, very little solar at the moment, but we are looking to that as a as a new way of a driving the um, ESG credentials of the business, but also as a it's, it's a revenue yeah. generator. You know, you you still have uh, to consider pricing, um, and there's a volatility in the utility pricing at the moment. However. If we can generate our own green electricity, green energy, and sell it to our customers, uh, and we can do that profitably, which of course we can, then there's a, there's a huge potential there. And you know, while we don't have the sun, um, there is a need. And again, it's trying to service what the customers need. You know, they they need clean space, um, accessible space, secure space. And if we can provide electricity as well at a at a, at a, at a reasonable cost, then it's a, a one stop shop. It's a, a service model really that we're trying to. Um, create, but there's there's certainly a lot of potential there. So that's the route you'd go down. You you'd sell it to, to absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, any any thoughts on that, Darren? With, with yeah, you? absolutely. I think we're in the fortunate position of of having an abundance of sun where we are and, and large roof spaces. What's put us off is some of the currency volatility we experienced in Africa. So we've had to wait until the sort of capex price point comes to a, a place that that makes sense, um, which it does now. A lot of the stuff we're looking at. Will probably return us payback periods of three to four years on on the solar panels just because of the productivity of them um we've also had to make sure of the quality and the robustness of a number of the solar panels because it's not as easy to get somebody out to come and service them um but it's an unbelievable opportunity um yeah i think the other thing is our tenants just require it um what's amazing is if you can provide these solutions the stickiness of your tenants just become um you know really really important and Again, going back to just sort of saying what we are, we try and provide these multinationals the same experience as if they're sitting in London, they need to be sitting in the middle of Cairo or, or, or Kenya, Nairobi, and have that same experience of sitting in an office building with the right technology, the right Wi-Fi, the right sort of green attributes, even right down to charging points and you know, cycle uh, bicycle docking stations. So it's the entire experience, but interestingly, we can monetize that at the moment and, and the payback periods are actually really interesting. That's good. Um, it was mentioned on a, a previous panel, I think, um, in someone's question, actually, um, the, the topic of AI. Now, we're very early days on that, and the potential of it is huge. What, how do you see that playing into real estate um, sector in general, but also in, in your businesses and sort of everyday life going forward? Um, who wants to take that? I'll start. I mean, I think it's um one of it's actually a threat as much as an opportunity because what we're seeing in africa are call centers and i'm sure each one of you are aware when you, you phone a call center and you get put through to somewhere in the world uh with an operator who picks up the phone um it's a great opportunity for us in the countries you operate because it creates so many jobs and we we provide the real estate solutions but it's a massive a massive threat because those jobs in africa could could evaporate Having said that, um, you know, the whole concept of, of tooling people up and using technology correctly is probably where the sort of types of uh, 
chatbots and AI uh, opportunities might come from. But yeah, for us at the moment, it's actually more of a threat given the type of tenants we have in, in our spaces. You know, there are opportunities, you're right, there's the threats and opportunities. Um, you know, if you, if you think about maybe buying a huge portfolio and you need to digest all of those leases as quickly as possible, AI, AI may provide a solution to that. Um, whether or not that will ever be as good as humans, and there's also the, the social impact of actually losing um, jobs is, is another discussion, but I think there's, there's certainly potential to use that and to build in more efficiencies, um, but there is a bigger question there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Are? Well, I just, I'm just building uh, what James was saying. You know, with the process of putting a building onto our exchange involves some documentation, some legal process, some reviews by accountants, and you, you could imagine all, all of that becoming hugely simplified by AI. So um, it, 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 it's not so much directly affecting us, but it, it should make the process of uh, using our exchange easier if these trends continue. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned jobs then, job losses, and the impact that could have on, on the officer sector. Um, do, you, do you feel, um, like I do, that eventually sort of governments are going to have to come in with, and, and regulate this because it could sort of come out, go out of control there. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's early days, and I think what governments often talk about doing is creating jobs. So the idea of bringing in businesses and uh, initiatives that promote AI, it's, it's great for business efficiency, but it, it's not congruent with job creation necessarily. Could well be, there may be different jobs, um, what the net job position is, I'm not sure. And I'm sure there's a spin from the politicians on that. But I think we're very early in the uh, development of AI. Um, but it will be a very hot potato for yeah. whichever incumbent um, party well, is in power. We'll be picking fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I firmly believe it's just one of those you'll have to learn to adapt to. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm, well, I'm hopeful that AI will be a, a great unleasher of productivity gains. It just means that human elements are going to have to figure out where their value add is. Um, uh, I'm pretty hopeful we're not going to have a whole world where there's just robots hanging around. <laughs> so my, my son's 16, and I have to think, what do I encourage him to become when he when he grows up and what should he be studying? Maybe fruit picking is the <laughs> I think the the speech they're given at school these days, but I could say the speech parents are given because my mind has just been thrown is don't worry about it because that what they'll do is probably not been invented yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the job title will be very new to us. We won't have a clue what our kids are doing. Yeah. Um bringing it back to sort of technology that's sort of here and now and, and, and use it. What 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 is the difference between and this is to do your sort of tenants and your customer base. What is their appetite in, in using the technology versus the uptake? Have you found? I think there's an appetite to have access to data um, quickly. Um, and that's something that we are um, iteratively uh, able to provide. You know, I think businesses and individuals want to know you know, where they are, you know, let them get their rent statement quickly or uh, have easy access to information um, with regards to their, their, their unit. Um, I think there's also, um, when it comes to um, ESG and that, that area, there is an appetite for tenants to, to, to be more environmentally sensitive. I think it depends on the different type of customer that we have. You know, the, the larger customers have their own uh, policies on, on ESG, which they need to follow, and they're very keen on taking green energy. The smaller occupiers will be still led by cost, you know, um, and I think that's slowly but surely changing, but um, customers will definitely have an interest in using technology to get information um, from us. Yeah, we experience the same. Uh, I think it's about measuring. I think if you go back five or 10 years, we just didn't measure a lot of the things we're measuring today. Mm. It's that information value that our clients are finding ability to work, uh, um, win their own business, uh, win their own contracts. Um, like in our area, social and community involvement is super important. So it's about being able to measure what impact you've had in, in sort of people's earnings and take homes and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but finally, they're even wanting to measure stuff like consumption. So you know, how much efficiency have they eked out? And with uh, it's not only a, a, a British thing with uh, the energy crises and electricity costs going up, 
we, those are substantial costs for our tenants. And so they become very sensitive to measuring and actively knowing on a day-to-day -day basis what their consumption is, which is something that didn't exist about five years ago in our buildings. And I look at it maybe less from a tenant point of view, but from investors' point of view, I, I think it's quite um, interesting that as we've just been through very difficult markets over the last 12 months, the, how many investors seem to have deprioritized ESG because it's uh, it, 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 it may be a luxury when uh, markets are going up. But I think from a real estate specifically point of view, that doesn't matter because your tenants are, are not going to stop going. And, and certainly you see in the London office markets, there are huge bifurcation between assets which are ESG, that have good ESG credentials, and those which are becoming stranded right before our very eyes. So um, and that's that's driven by tenants. So investors are going to be paying attention whether they want to or not. Yeah, that's an that's um, interesting point on... So do you think it, there's going to be a green premium or... Uh, I've heard the term brown discount. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think what was previously a green premium is rapidly becoming a, a brown discount, it, it, by which I mean it's not so much that you get a premium for being green, it's you have to be green. Yeah. Uh, and, the disc, and, the, and the discount for brown now is, is almost becoming existential. Uh, it was supposed to figure 80% of all of the buildings that need to meet net zero targets already exist. And it's much harder to retrofit a building than to, uh, to, to, to burn it from you. Equally, 40% of the carbon is generated by people knocking down buildings. So it's not as easy as just sort of knocking over all the old buildings and redeveloping them. So th th there is a, a that discount is growing rapidly. Yeah. And that's when you look at the different asset classes, it's very obvious where you can be greener. You know, if, you, if you look at office buildings, which may have a big refurb every five to 10 years, that's a big refurb. Some of them are even knocked down and we, we start again. There are other areas, you know, with sheds, for example, there's only so much you can do. They're built and functionally they don't change in how they are used. Well, ever. You know, it's a box for which um, different activities can take place. And what we can do to try and improve our ratings, our EPC ratings, we put in LED lights, we clad um, on some, we can put in uh, solar panels, we, we take out heating. Um, and actually that makes it easier for us to 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 be environmentally or to, to be sustainable and to have those higher epc ratings than say an office building um which has to continually adapt because of the the, the need for the occupiers uh, whereas the need of our occupiers is fundamentally unchanged they come in they want to see a clean space in which they can do a myriad of different um things yeah, and i think that the discrepancy between it's a it's a green premium or a, or a brown discount i think it's by sector absolutely we've had to invest uh, being a multi-sectoral fund the capex has gone into retail and office because that's where you absolutely try to, to get those tenants back in specifically in office you're trying to tempt people back into the office and so you do need to lead with both esg technology solutions because again often if you want to work at home do a poor broadband and, and poor sort of ventilation and, and, and sort of green ratings. Um, we're only seeing latterly the industrial sheds are only now sort of coming up that curve where tenants are becoming a lot more sensitive. So it depends by sector absolutely where where you're required to or where it's a nice to have still. Cool. Okay. Um should we should we open it up to questions um now from the room? <laughs> <laughs> Resident. Sorry. I'm really excited about the uh, Rogers, your project, um, your real estate stock exchange. I've got a few questions, so please bear with me. Uh, are you keen to, what is the vision with it? Do you really want to make it a stock so that we can buy real estate anywhere with a click of a button and then sell? Uh, yeah, and the, the vision I, I see is that... Um, you know, when I, look at, when I look at the markets in London, we have a petroleum exchange, we have a metal exchange, we have a futures exchange, we have a stock exchange in the London Stock Exchange uh, where companies can list. And now we have a real estate exchange. So in the long run, you guys should be listed on our, our, our exchange, not... Uh, so so uh, well, how do you deal with this? Because I am, <clears throat> excuse me, so since 2004, I've been a real estate investor and then I went into financial trading. So I understand the two asset classes and the way I protect my my capital is by understanding the volatility one being a real private equity asset class which is very hard to execute a buy and sell instantly whereas 
if your vision comes to light, which is very exciting, you change that from a private equity to a now a currency volatility, which would then make me think, oh my God, I could lose a lot of money in real estate. It's no longer a safe asset class. How do you deal with that? It's a, it's, it's a good question. It's a question I get asked often. Uh, and of course, I would say there's a difference between transparency and risk. Your buildings are changing in value every day. It's just nobody's telling you what it is. But we can't execute. That's the beauty of real estate. We, or, that, or, that's or, why... or the horror of it, depending on how you look at it. But if, you're, like if you're in an open-ended fund, which is... Because the emotion's taken out. When I, I can't go crazy with the, you know, the buy and sell emotions with real estate, which is why I've always done so well. But with financial markets, you can go crazy. Well, maybe there's a lesson there. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't trade your stocks too often either. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm a good trader now. But when I started, I was awful. Yeah. But I'm just thinking your vision could be quite groundbreaking. So yeah, and, and look, responsibility. Price, I hope prices <laughs> prices will vary uh, because of, because we're creating a market that um, that that can have real time data and real time trading and trades every day rather than I think if you if you speak to the agents they expect to trade a a, a building every seven yeah, each building every seven years that's roughly the life of the private equity fund we're talking about uh, seeing the whole value of uh, if you if you look at what's happened with trading data on our exchange so far. You, 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 would, you would expect roughly 25% of the market cap of each company to, to trade each year. So that means the buildings if they're in effect turning over once every four years rather than once every seven years. Um, individuals, however, are going to be able to take control of their trading decisions. And trade it's also out. reckless in a way for real estate. I think it will just change everyone's appetite. And I think Fast forward. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. I think it's innovation at its, at its finest, but I feel like the real estate outlook will be completely different maybe six years down the line if your vision carries on because real estate won't be safe. I live in Monaco. Most of the guys there have only made money off real estate and they did it because they forgot about their money that was caught up in bricks and mortar. I understand your point, but I disagree profoundly with it. That we're not making real estate less safe. We're making it more transparent. Okay. And is it on a blockchain, did you say? It's not it's not yet. But it's, you, token, you said token. That's the that's the, the vision that's I would expect. Yeah. Um, we're working with lots of the um, people trying to bring in blockchain because the reality is particularly if you're talking about equity yep. and debt, the reality is regulators are not going to let um, equity get traded on native blockchain because that you, you can't have securities in, in a in a in a, a, a blind um, situation where regulators don't know who the beneficial owners are. So what what I think is going to happen is people will equitize the assets and then tokenize that equity, and that's what we're already doing. So I, I think the next step is to do security token offerings, which will look a little bit like the ADR ADR model. People will take equity listed on our exchange, put it into a custody account, and issue tokens against that. But the transparency on a blockchain is very good. So you mentioned it's not transparent. Uh, re regulators uh, don't, uh, are very nervous about, about uh, blockchain and are going to want to see securities laws transposed onto it. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Okay, thank you. I have, a quick, I have a question for Roger. So what does it do for costs? Because surely you're taking the scale of a REIT and you're sort of bifurcating it right down to a single asset. So surely it makes it less effective. The reality is that the incremental costs are uh, quite a lot uh, smaller than you, you might expect. But but I take the point. You know, they, they, it, it will not work for assets of every size. You know, it, it, um, we uh, we we suggest to people that assets that are smaller than fifty million in lot size, um, it, it might not be the most efficient way to uh, uh, to to market them. Um, but the incremental costs are are smaller than you think. And the biggest cost when you look at it. Um, uh, you look at a, a, a traditional external um, cost model uh, is that the fund management is, is the investment management, not the asset management, of course, but the investment management is taken out of it because we're inviting you guys to be the investment manager. So there's a big chunk of cost that does, does get taken out. So net, 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 we, we would expect on a pro forma basis to see EPRA cost ratios of around 10%. Any other questions in the room? Oh, we've got any online. Yeah, sure. Um, <coughs> oh, it's come from online, but uh, touching on something that Roger mentioned earlier, 
Um, uh, what's given the environment for the property market at present? What's your investors' views on continued spending on technology, whether or not um, it's an additional expense they want to bear at a time when uh, when markets are weak and prime valuations are, are weak? Is that for um, for Jack, panel, James, James, James. But I think technology spend is going to be um, not a nice to have, but in due course, it, it, it will be essential in order to operate real estate uh, efficiently uh, and to give you that market advantage, that uh, that USP. So it's certainly what, what we're doing. However, the important point here is the number I mentioned before, the 5 million, um, is not something we expect to be spending every three or four years. What we've bought into is um, an evergreen solution. So it's that you, you build the platform. And then there are incremental costs as you upgrade, enhance, um, which are nowhere near that. And that what you can do, you then benefit from the billions that Microsoft invest in development uh, R&D every year. Um, and as new players come into the market, their new uh, partners, we can benefit from, from those players as well. So we, we've sort of come in with a, an overall, overall partner in Microsoft, which will allow us to continue to continue to invest, but not at a rate that um, would create any concern and would have a, a big impact on cost ratios. We have the same, uh, we didn't quite spend 5 million, but we, we spent probably half of that. Um, it's the efficiency gains you, you gain going forward. So yes, this year's cost ratios look a little out of kilter. Um, our investors are happy with that um, because they see the vision of where we're taking it. It's the scalability and the solution. I mean, just practical examples, we've had people in our and our asset management teams having to report back and it would take them 10 days to produce a report. And now that's just a click of a button. Um, it puts them in the market, it puts them out in the field, you know, leasing, renting, doing the right things that they need to be doing. Any other? Well, the other one was uh, to, to Roger specifically. Um, where's the interest coming from, uh, from assets to list is this from sort of landlords uh, looking to list property and uh, how are you targeting the potential investors at the other side of that okay well there's a, there's an, a number of um use cases and don't don't worry i won't, I won't go through them all because it would be, be boring but yeah you know um landlords um opportunity funds private equity i think perhaps the most exciting new source of product into real estate capital markets is coming from owner occupiers. Yeah, we often find that uh, a company that uses its real estate as a tool rather than as an investment, it's just a fixed asset to do. We'll, we'll often, just take as an example, of, 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 it's a hypothetical example, we'll take a factory. You know, the finance director might be persuaded that this is a, you know, raising capital on our exchange is a really clever way to avoid bringing in new debts and to take a fixed asset and monetize it but partially monetize it so you can continue to use the asset. And the chairman may at that point say, no, it's a key asset, we're not going to do that. Um, this is why perhaps sale and leasebacks haven't been done in the past. But because we're doing this now onto an exchange where you can buy the shares back, it removes that, that fear. Same with a lot of family offices we speak to who don't want to lose control of assets. Um, in terms of investors, we, we are finding the early adopters. Uh, so far, we've had uh, well over 100 di different investors. Uh, and I would say um, you know, less than 10 of them have been traditional institutional investors. Most of them have been people investing their own money. Now, that, that the, the smallest investment we've seen at IPO was for £2,000. The largest was for £10 million. Um, some of those individuals are ultra high net worth, but it's interesting that they're investing their own money. So they are, um, if you like, less afraid of an innovative product than professional investors may, may, maybe have to be to start with. So, but that's that again, I expect to see change quite rapidly as we look less novel by the day. Have you had any interest from um, current REITs to spin out a couple of their assets and into the platform? Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've spoken to. I must be careful not to say too much that we reveal them. But you know, an, an obvious sort of conversation we like to have is if um, particular assets are, are, are dominant within a balance sheet that's trading at a discount. Mm. I, 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 our conversation we were having with Intu, for example, was around the traffic centre. Take this one very good asset, mm -hmm. and of course, because our, our proposition is that 
on our exchange because the assets are so transparent. Why, why would a trade at a 30% discount to NAV? Yeah, it, it, the answer is they don't. So it's, it's, it's if you like, just sort of simple demerger methodology, mm. take, um, take an asset um, out of uh, actually the discount. We're having similar conversations there with some of the long income funds where they, they, the assets that they, they have a, potentially um, too large in the context of the fund. And again, they don't necessarily want to sell the assets, but they can reduce their economic exposure to it by listing it. So, and, and these are new, stru new structuring options that people didn't have before. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, got any more in the room or any online? No, I don't think we have. So we'll wrap that up there, I think. Thanks a lot, guys. So really <laughs>